Hey everyone, and welcome to Travel Through Stories. My name is Sean, and today I want to talk about Maiko Kawakami's new novel, Heaven, translated from the Japanese by Sam Bett and David Boyd. This is the first I've read of Kawakami, but I've been hearing a lot about her since last year when she came out with the English translation of her, her novel, Breasts and Eggs, which received a lot of positive and enthusiastic attention. Um, and I was actually first drawn to that book, uh, but I figured I would read Heaven first, as it just came out a few months ago, and I can't really resist a new publication. Heaven is narrated by an unnamed 14-year-old boy who suffers relentless bullying from his classmates. He doesn't really have any friends, and he has a lazy eye, which is all it really takes for his classmates to continually put him through hell. And this bullying is pretty brutal. I think as a society, we've grown to uh, uh, widen our definition of what bullying is, especially in the age of social media and stuff like that. But what our narrator goes through is very physical and physically humiliating. He's beaten, he's made to eat animal feces, uh, etc. And all of this in the broad sight of all of his classmates, none of whom ever intervene. In many ways, the bullying that our narrator goes through is, at times, cartoonishly sadistic. Um, he's like one of the inhabitants of Dante's hell, um, as his entire existence is just this series of torture. So for me, this comes across as a bit ridiculous at times, a bit too cartoonish. Um, but I think what Kawakami is doing by having these repeated torture scenes is showing how heavy and all-encompassing uh, bullying is to the victim. It's really all they can think about, and there really seems to be no escape from the hell that they're currently in. And we're made to witness this bullying right alongside our narrator, just as Virgil makes Dante witness all the tortures of hell. But we're not the only one witnessing it. After a particularly violent bullying session, our narrator is laying on the ground of the gymnasium floor, bleeding out profusely. And the text reads, All I could do was open my mouth wide to breathe air in and out. As I lay breathing, my bleeding body rose up to the ceiling, joining the grid-like pattern of the rafters. The me at the ceiling turned to face the me lying on my back on the floor, and, and only then began to descend. I was wearing my uniform and glasses, and was bloody from the eyes down. I was getting closer by the second. When we were only six feet apart, he halted in midair. The me who was floating motionless just stared at me, not saying anything. His eyes were thick, like gelatin behind his glasses, directionless as far as I could tell. I muttered to him, What do you think you're looking at? Facing me like this, I saw how small I was, wrists and ankles and neck laughably thin, not a hint of strength. My blazer didn't fit well in the shoulders, and my shirt, crimson at the chest, had come untucked. My pants were at least a size too big. I looked like my body had been tacked to the sky at a precarious angle. This detachment from himself is a kind of disassociation that occurs quite a bit with trauma victims, at least as far as I understand. Um, but what I think is really important here is how, in a kind of vicious cycle, our narrator's perception of himself is constantly being negotiated and staged for himself as every time he sees himself, he recognizes it less and less. With that said, though, there is a glimmer of hope for our young narrator. Every Dante needs their Virgil, or Beatrice, after all. And early in this book, in the first sentence, in fact, uh, he starts receiving these mysterious letters uh, asking him to meet after school. Of course, in his paranoia, he refuses to believe that these letters are from a friend, and he thinks it's you know, some, some big prank to, to get him somewhere um, so he can be bullied more. But eventually, he does give in and goes and, and, and meets this person. And it turns out to be this young girl in his class named Kojima. Kojima is also an outcast in the class. And they begin this beautiful friendship that is really the heart of this novel. Um, it's in this friendship that Kawakami's emotional intelligence and her writing really shine. As these two begin writing letters back and forth, and they really find solace in each other's friendship. It's sort of a trope as old as time just like the bullying. But again, I, I think Kawakami is aware of this trope and is using it to really emphasize the power that a single helping hand can have on a victim of bullying. Further, this cartoonishly evil bullying juxtaposed by the kind of you know, power of friendship uh, trope helps Kawakami stage in a sort of magnified and uh, uh, exaggerated way a dialectic that tries to reconcile these two opposite ends of humanity evil and good, hate and love, hell and heaven. For me, the most powerful parts of this book are the moments when our two characters, our narrator and Kojima, have these long conversations and they try to figure out 
why the things that are happening to them are happening to them. Does their pain even have meaning? This sounds a bit silly and juvenile, but it's really not. I mean, questions like the problem of evil have kept philosophers and theologians up at night for millennia. And these two questions come up quite a bit in this book, the problem of evil and the existential uh, question, do our lives have meaning? After a pretty long conversation about whether or not God exists, they, they begin talking about meaning and how, how meaning is formed. And Kojima explains that we'll understand some things while we're alive and some after we die, but it doesn't really matter when it happens. What matters is that all the pain and all the sadness have meaning. When she had spoken, she was silent, and I tried to, f I tried to follow her lead silently. I pinched my sweaty shirt away from my back, letting my skin feel the breeze. She lifted her chin from her hands and gripped the railing firmly, hoisting herself up. Now she looked at me. Why do you think they do it? Why do you think they treat us like they do? I couldn't look at her. My chest was thumping. I could feel my heart racing. I swallowed all my spit. Know what I think? She said. They aren't even thinking. Not at all. They're just doing what they've seen other people do, following blindly. They don't know what it means or why they're doing it. You and me, we're just an outlet for them. Kojima sighed. But it isn't meaningless. When it's all over, we'll reach a place somewhere or something we could never reach without having gone through everything we've gone through. Know what I mean? And this conversation goes on quite, quite a bit. And Kawakami really does, I think, an exceptional job staging these conversations because she never really gives an answer. And these conversations never come across as too um, moralizing or didactic. Kawakami remains impartial. She kind of just stages these two opposite uh, uh, ends of the philosophical question. Um, and I really like when authors are able to do that. And this question, does weakness like strength also have meaning, comes up repeatedly, especially towards the end of this book. And they have much more longer conversations that I won't get into because I don't want to spoil anything. With all this pain and suffering, though, there has to be a search for something greater. To run my Comedia uh, uh, comparison into the ground, at some point they need to leave hell and begin climbing Mount Purgatory, right? And in fact, Kojima, like I noted earlier, does act as a sort of Beatrice and guide up this mountain. Relatively early in this book, Kojima wants to show our narrator heaven, and she writes to him in a letter that we should go to heaven on the first day of summer vacation. It can be the first thing we do this summer, the very first. So Kojima brings our narrator to this museum, and they look at all of these paintings that have all these really wonderful descriptions. The paintings here were mystifying. In the reds and greens of the canvases, maidens danced with animals. A goat or something carried a violin in its mouth, and a man and a woman embraced under a gigantic blazing bouquet. The swarm of unrelated images was like a glimpse into a dream, but not a good one. The joy I saw there was ferocious, and the sadness suffocatingly cold. Blues thrown onto the canvas, warred with yellows approaching like tornadoes. People gathered round aghast to watch a circus spin to life. Above a city of snow, a man in white robes closed his eyes and prayed. Every painting was a moment of destruction, coinciding with the birth of something wonderful. Each frame contained conflicting worlds. A crowd drawn into a sun spinning like a windmill. Fish washed ashore. A leery horse with eyes more human than anyone alive. A pale maiden. The paintings that are being described are super surreal. They, they sound to me like something Pablo Picasso would paint. Um, but they're also, they're embodying this conflict between good and evil, creation and destruction that I mentioned earlier and that this book is really interested in, these two polar opposite sides of the human experience. And the one painting that Kojima really wants to show our narrator is one called Heaven, and she explains what it looks like. Heaven is a painting of two lovers eating cake in a room with a red carpet and a table. It's so beautiful. And what's really cool is that they can stretch their necks however they want. Wherever they go, wherever they do, nothing ever comes between them. Isn't that the best? It sounds like a pretty interesting painting, but we never actually reach it. Um, we never see heaven, nor does our narrator. The closest we get to it is this secondhand description of it. In a way, throughout the rest of this book, this trip to the museum that Kojima takes our narrator is our narrator's heaven, in a way, as this excursion is really the only super positive uh, experience that our narrator has throughout this entire book, and he remembers it fondly. 
Overall, I think this book did a lot of interesting things with adolescence, um, but it did stray a bit too far into the YA genre for my liking, um, but I think that might just be personal preference. I do think that Kawakami was aware of this straying into the YA genre, um, and she was consciously playing with the genre rather than just doing the genre, if that makes sense. I think there is a fair distinction there. I am glad I read it though. I, I think it's important to be reminded um, how magnified and loud and all-encompassing adolescence really is. But let me know what you think and if you've read any Kawakami. I'm interested to see what others think of this book, especially as her previous novel, Breasts and Eggs, was really, really popular, especially on booktube. I mean, a lot of people had a lot of thoughts on it. Um, but for now, thanks for watching.